As a lover of history, I've always imagined that every field across the British landscape could tell a story. Like this one, for example. Nothing really remarkable about it. It's located a mile south of the English village of Marden in Kent. Winchet Hill is over there. Part of the beautiful vista in which I was raised not a mile from where I'm standing now. But something happened in this field 80 years ago today, which gave rise to what I believe to be one of the most extraordinary stories of the Second World War. They even made a film about it. It's the story of a little boy, Franz, born in 1914 at the outbreak of World War I in Leuk, a small peaceful town in the Swiss Alps. Franz's family falls into hardship after his father, Baron Leo von Vera, is made bankrupt and loses his fortune and the family estate. Cast onto hard times, the von Veras decide that their youngest infant boy, Franz Xavier, and his sister, Emma Charlotte, will be sold to a childless couple. The von Habers agree to provide for their upbringing and education in Germany. Franz and Emma are not told of their true origins and grow up believing the von Habers to be their true parents. As time passes, however, the Habers' marriage comes under strain with financial difficulties, which force the family to sell their ancestral home and move into the city of Cologne. France grows up between the wars, boisterous, bold, restless. One day, his stepfather seeks him out and decides, since France has almost come of age, to inform the boy of his true Swiss lineage and family name. He is Franz von Vera of Leuk, Switzerland. By this time, Hitler and his National Socialists are now in charge of the fatherland. Franz is much taken with all the Nazi pageantry. And when his parents divorce a short while later, Franz leaves home and joins Hitler's SA to prepare him for a military career. And for the first time, France dreams of flying. He joins the Luftwaffe in 1936, and as his exceptional abilities and courage become evident during his training, France earns his shot at every new German pilot's dream. His first solo flight in the Luftwaffe's latest frontline weapon.
Geliebtes Schwesterchen, gestern mein erster richtiger Ball. Wenn gerade niemand hersah, so stellte ich mich vor einen der großen Spiegel. Ein Fliegeruniformfrack ist wirklich ein Gedicht. Jedes Mal, wenn ein Herr oder eine Dame Herr Leutnant zu mir sagten, wurde ich, glaube ich, rot wie ein Schuljunge, der beim ersten Rauchversuch ertappt wurde. Es war unfasslich schön. Ohne dich, du lieber, treuer Kamerad, hätte ich den Weg nach oben sicher längst aufgegeben oder verloren. Dafür bin ich dir ewig dankbar, dein Buschi. Franz von Werra is commissioned a Leutnant in 1938, and he lives the lifestyle of the new German aristocracy of the fighter pilot. He gains a reputation among his peers as a bit of a braggart, a boisterous self-promoter. German morale is sky high as the other nations shrink before Hitler's mobilization of the Nazis' huge war machine. Since the Treaty of Versailles was signed in 1919, there have been only a few really momentous days in the history of Europe. Mussolini marching on Rome, Stalin launching his first five-year plan, Hitler breaking the bonds of Versailles one by one. Today comes another such mighty moment as Hitler's bond bursting finally carries Nazi expansion across the borders of Germany into the land of his birth. At the outbreak of World War II, France is made adjutant of number two group fighter wing JG3. The Nazi press soon latches onto France during a visit to his unit one day for a photo shoot. France ensures that he takes maximum advantage of this opportunity. He poses with his Messerschmitt and his pet lion Simba, the unit's mascot. Soon, pictures of France and Simba are appearing in contemporary magazines all across the Reich. And two heroes are born. Hitler's attack on Western Europe begins on May the 10th, 1940. The Luftwaffe proves unstoppable during the invasion of the Low Countries, which crumble before the relentless assault of Blitzkrieg. The British fighters based in France, among them the Hawker Hurricane, often find themselves outnumbered by 109s, equipped with those lethal 20mm cannons. France frequently flies as wingman to Hauptmann Erich von Zeller, the commanding officer of the unit. France notches up four victories during the Battle of France, one hurricane, two brigades and a Moran. France is scornful of the enemy he faces. Wir schleichen nach Indianerart auf leisen Sohlen um die Wolkentürme und verdrehen uns schier das Genick, um ja keinen Vogel mit einer Kokarde am Rumpf zu übersehen, der abschießbar ist. Eine Heidenangst haben sie jetzt schon alle vor uns und versuchen alle gleich nach den ersten Salven auszureißen. Nützen tut es ihnen aber gar nichts. Wir sind viel schneller, sicherer, zäher und es ist gar kein Problem, sie zum Absturz zu bringen. Kuss und eine Kanonenmunitionstrommel voller liebster Grüße schickt dein Buschi. Hitler's attention turns to Britain at the beginning of July. And now the Luftwaffe commences its air assault on the Royal Air Force and its airfields. German morale is high. But it is only now that the Luftwaffe fighter pilots come face to face with the Supermarine Spitfire in significant numbers for the very first time. The Battle of Britain is fought ferociously on both sides. The RAF have the advantage of fighting over home territory. So if a British pilot is shot down and parachutes safely to Earth, he can be back in the air in a replacement fighter in a matter of hours. A German pilot only has 15 minutes flight time over England before having to return to France for refueling. If a Luftwaffe pilot is shot down and survives the parachute drop to earth, he finds himself on English soil and out of the war for the duration. Auf jeder Kuhweide oder auf allen Getreidefeldern an der ganzen Kanalküste liegt jetzt das Gros unserer fliegenden, kampferprobten Armada. Der Katzensprung über den Kanal ist lächerlich. Ich freue mich rasend auf die guten englischen Jagdflieger jetzt und in einem Monat haben wir sie sicher auch vernascht. In der Übung sind wir jetzt schon recht gut. Kuss, dein Buschi. 
The opposing pilots are so aggressive and the air battles so intense that fighters and bombers sometimes collide in mid-air during the confusion. Debris rains down on the English countryside. All around Marden, the fields and woods become littered with the broken aircraft at both sides. France, now promoted to Oberleutnant, is right in the thick of it. JG-3 are flying operations almost daily. But in spite of his early successes in May, France becomes frustrated that his battle tally fails to advance over the next three months. Worse still, the Royal Air Force is proving far harder to kill than the Luftwaffe pilots have been led to believe. The more Spitfires and Hurricanes the Germans shoot down, the more seem to be waiting for them the following day. And many are no longer flown by beginners. Gar nicht wie die höhere Führung es sich vorgestellt hat, rollt der Laden, weil die Engländer nicht im Entferntesten so feige sind, wie der Rundfunk dauernd berichtet. Die Jagderfolge müssen so mühsam ergattert werden und manchmal bleiben sie ganz aus. Thursday, September the 5th, sees one of the Battle of Britain's most intense fighting days. Eric von Zeller and Franz lead JG-3 on escort duty for a swarm of bombers on a mission to level Croydon. On the return leg back over Kent, the German bombers are set upon by a horde of RAF fighters. In the melee, Franz's engine is hit and his radio knocked out. Yet more Spitfires join the fray. Desperate to get away, France dives down to treetop level. Beim Rückflug hing ich etwas hinter unserem Hauptverband ab und kam in eine ganz rasante Kurbelei mit einer Horde englischer Jäger. Mein tapferer Vogel hielt sich pfundig, aber als der Motor zerschossen war, schmiss ich den Vogel hin und wurde Prisoner of War, südlich von London. Yours? Mine. Right, you two, stand guard over the plane. France crash lands in this field at Love's Farm, south of Marden. Miriam Honess, whose family owned the farm, was an eyewitness to the drama. 
I heard the stupendous roar of a very close aeroplane, and to my horror, the black crosses and swastika of a Messerschmitt flashed very low by the top west window. The Messerschmitt was so low that the Lewis gun at the searchlight, 250 yards along the road, shot at it. Round and round the house flew the German with the Spitfire firing volleys of bullets and determined not to lose his quarry. Just by our own gate, the soldiers just setting out for the crashed hurricane all fired their rifles. Then I heard Mother call, he's down and I dashed into my room to behold the Messerschmitt just settled in the middle of the 30 acres. It was most exciting watching the soldiers run across the field carrying their rifles. Let's see what this slot looks like on a map. France is flying out of Wier au Bois here, nine miles southeast of Boulogne. He's on a bombing mission to Croydon, and he gets jumped by fighters, including Gerald Stapleton and Pat Hughes, and crashes at Love's Farm on a direct bearing from Croydon back to his base in France. So that checks out. If we zoom into... There's Marden. We zoom into the crash site, south of Marden, on the 30 acres. A couple of points here. There's a little bridge that France is led off, where his plane crashed. Right there. There's the bridge there, which leads into what used to be an orchard. That's interesting in a minute. France is led up to the road along that path, onto the Goudhurst Road, just up a little way into Miriam's Drive. And then he gets put here, in a shack near the searchlight unit. Now here's the 1940 map of the area, and you see that he walks over that little bridge into an orchard. There's a story that France plucks an apple from one of the trees and munches it disdainfully as he's been led into captivity. He's taken up to this corrugated shack. There's nothing there now, but we did get a picture of it, which was provided. There it is. And this is where France is given cocoa and sandwiches by the soldiers while they await the arrival of the police. Here's what France's plane would have looked like in the air. And here is the famous shot of the crash site. The plane's in good condition. Let's enhance the picture. And a couple of things. Firstly, 13 kills on the tail. More about that later. In the tree line behind the lads, you see houses. So, given the location of buildings in the area, this can only be the Goudhurst Road, which is the brown road to the left of the Red Arrow, which would indicate that France's plane crash-landed south-north. The 30 acres marks a major waypoint in France's life. Hitherto, he's been part of an invincible Reich. Now, he's been shot down by the very British who he's been mocking for the past few months. France finds himself alone. He's angry, shocked at how quickly his fortunes have changed. In France's mind, there's no question that he must immediately escape, get back to Germany and rejoin the war. And the story about how he does just that is told in the 1957 film, The One That Got Away, starring Hardy Kruger. Incredibly, Franz von Vera remains the only enemy Battle of Britain combatant to escape from Canada and return to Germany. Wait, Canada? The police arrive at Love's farm. Franz is driven away to County Police Headquarters at Wrens Cross Maidstone. Here, 
he apparently befriends a little boy, the son of the chief superintendent, and gives him some memorabilia from his tunic. Then onto the barracks of the Queen's own Royal West Kent Regiment. Here, France unsuccessfully attempts to overwhelm his guard with a pickaxe, which only earns him more restrictions. After that, France is transferred to Trent Park in Hertfordshire, and it is during his 18-day interrogation here that he tells British intelligence how, during one Battle of Britain's sortie on the 28th of August, he destroyed nine British fighters, four in the air and five on the ground. Upon returning to the airfield, the Luftwaffe intelligence officers widen their eyes at France's story. There's no battle damage on his plane, and no witnesses since France lagged behind on the return leg. But since France is adjutant of JG3, a compromise is agreed. France is given the four aerial victories, but not the five on the ground. Which does not stop France from immediately ordering his ground crew to paint all nine victory bars on the tail of his 109, which raises his tally to 13, which makes France an ace. The Luftwaffe overlook the impudence. It's good for morale, and the Nazi press will make much of this propaganda to its subscribers on both sides of the English Channel. Three weeks later at Trent Park, the British intelligence officers quickly check France's battle claim, which turns out to be fraudulent. Tell me, supposing your comrades were to hear the truth about this notable exploit of yours, their achievements are genuine. What kind of a life do you think you'll lead among them in a prison camp when they know that your glory is largely fictitious? Answering the German broadcast so recently boasting of von Vera's successes, the BBC publicly ridicules France's claims, which is interpreted by number two group JG3 as yet further evidence that France's victories did indeed take place and that the British are just lying to maintain national morale in the face of almost certain defeat. After which, France is nominated for the Iron Cross First Class, which is awarded in his absence on the 14th of December, 1940. After Trent Park, France is shunted all the way up north to prisoner of war camp number one at Grisdale Hall in the Lake District. Here, he escapes while out on a daytime prisoner's walk. He's recaptured, he escapes again. He's recaptured. He's then sent to POW camp number 13 at Swanwick, Derbyshire. France tunnels out of this one with comrades, all of whom are recaptured, except for France, dressed in his flying suit, who makes his way to RAF Hucknall, here, he blags his way into one of the hangars, posing as a Dutch pilot who's been cleared to take a hurricane for a test flight. Get out. I think he was probably extremely audacious, probably more cheeky than... than Hardy Kruger portrayed him in the film. He, I, be, I believe from what I've heard that he was a very um, confident person, extremely confident. Um, and he just uh, wanted to escape and get back to Germany, that's all that was in his mind, right from the time he was captured. After that, France is put on board a ship with other German prisoners and he sailed across the North Atlantic to Canada. But even before he gets to his prisoner of war camp located on the north shore of Lake Superior, France jumps out of the train with seven prisoners, all of whom are recaptured, apart from France.
Francis charged with entering America illegally, but the German consul bails him out. Francis' incredible adventure comes to the attention of the American press. True to form, France does not hold back from recounting a highly embellished account of his exploits to an astonished American public. He's famous again. While in the Big Apple, France buys a postcard, jots down some words, and sends it on its way. It's not addressed to his sister Emma, nor to Elfie, a lovely Austrian girl who awaits him back in Germany. Weeks later, seated in his office at RAF Hucknall, squadron leader Boniface reviews the morning's post. From New York. Dear Sir, Friendliest greetings and remembrances of an unusual and pleasant Saturday morning, December the 22nd, 1940, in your office. This is a fine town, and I give you two guesses of how I got here, but the first guess will probably be the right one. See you soon, and best of luck for you. Cheerio! Franz von Vera, formerly. Captain Van Lott. While the Canadian and American authorities argue over Baron von Vera's fate, the German consul helps France slip across the border into Mexico. From there, he heads south to Panama, Peru, Bolivia, Rio de Janeiro. France continues to live extraordinary adventures which are changing him. From the patient civil treatment he received in England, despite the provocations, to the genuine admiration the Americans had for his courage. The daily journeys down through Central and South America merge into one another. Life's languid pace, the shimmering heat, dreamscape scenery, the jungles, the vast open spaces. All these experiences widen France's perspective, far beyond the Nazis and the war. While the search is on for France thousands of miles to the north, a nondescript German by the name of Bernard Nartus boards a scheduled Italian flight from Rio to Europe. In this fashion, Oberleutnant Baron Franz von Vera returns to Berlin to a hero's welcome on April 18, 1941, seven months after he was shot down in this field. Adolf Hitler awards France the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross, and he's promoted to Hauptmann, Captain. France writes a book for the nation about his exploits, entitled Meiner Flucht aus England, My Escape from England. France returns to active duty during the summer of 1941. He's posted to the Russian front as group commander for fighter wing JG-53. He scores a further 13 victories, which raises his overall confirmed total to 21. August 1941. France and JG 53 return to Germany on leave. 
France and Elfie marry at the beautiful monastery church at Boy Rong beside the Danube. It's a no-expenses-spared military wedding, with a guard of honour attended by officers in dress uniform. France, at the pinnacle of his aristocratic aspirations, a national war hero, decorated by the Fuhrer himself. Shortly after, France takes his leave of Elfi when JG-53 is redeployed to Katwijk on the coast of occupied Holland. Here, his fighter wing is upgraded to the latest and most formidable version of the Luftwaffe's frontline fighter. Liebste Mo, wir halten die Wacht im Westen und legen unser Veto ein, wenn englische Bomber kommen wollen. Selten passiert dies aber nur. Ansonsten leben wir recht ruhig und friedlich hier. Liebling, ich hab dich lieb und ich bin nach wie vor dein Buschi. These are the last words Emma ever hears from her brother. Two weeks later, on the 25th of October, Franz takes off on a training flight with another pilot. Wie der Oberleutnant, mein damaliger Leutnant Leonard, zurückkam und gemeldet hat, dass Kommandeur neben ihm flog und plötzlich von übergekippt ist, rein ins Wasser weg war er. Er flog noch rüber, hat nachgeschaut, ob irgend was zu sehen war, nichts mehr war zu sehen. Kommen wir zurück und die Stimmung sank auf Null. Eine Stecknadel im Wasser. Franz's plane plunges into the North Sea, north of Lissingen. There's speculation that the engine failed, even that it was no accident as several other aces died in unusual circumstances around the same time. Nothing more is known. Franz is presumed killed, as his body is never recovered. Als der nach Berlin zurückgekommen ist, muss er ein anderer Mensch gewesen sein. Er hat ja andere Leute in Südamerika, in Nordamerika getroffen. Andere Rassen, andere Religionen, Menschen anderer Kulturen und Mentalitäten. Das muss Eindruck auf ihn gemacht haben. Und es gibt ja auch, ich glaube, es gibt ja auch Beweise dafür, dass eine Veränderung in dem Mann eingetreten ist. Er hat ein Buch geschrieben, das wurde nie veröffentlicht. Warum? Wahrscheinlich hat er das Buch zu England freundlich geschrieben. Aber in letzter Konsequenz muss man eigentlich sagen, Franz, du Kanalie, warum bist du nicht bloß in Kanada in dem Lager geblieben? Stell dir mal vor, der, wäre, der hätte das alles überlebt. Und dann hätte er seinen Traum erfüllen können, mit dem Land Rover durch Afrika zu fahren, mit seiner Erika. Und dann von unterwegs hätte der sicherlich hervorragende Bücher zurückgeschickt. Emma and Elfie were heartbroken. But in time the war ended, Elfie remarried, and the world moved on. The world always moves on. Battle of Britain pilots are all gone now, but the fields will always hold their secrets. As does the sea, pilots still in their cockpits dreaming the dream of all they had been.
to ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word, victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. But without victory there is no survival. Blitzkrieg sweeps across the Low Countries. They seem unstoppable. Churchill saw them coming, Germany rearming. But in Britain, the preparations for the inevitable invasion, many secretly believe, are too little too late. The younger generations take a different view. Bolstered with fighters coming in from the Empire territories, Britain's new soldiers, and especially her pilots, now have very different weapons to fight with than their fathers did in the First War. Some new recruits are no more than 18. Young men like William Pierce Horton Rafter, known to his friends and family as Robin. Pilot officer Rafter has a forever connection with Marden village. Here in this field known as Jewel House. Robin did not lose his life here, but he did unwittingly play a part in one of the Second World War's more exotic dramas. Robin Rafter is born at Elmley Lodge Harborn, Birmingham, to Sir Charles and Lady Catherine Rafter on the 17th of July, 1921. Robin is the youngest of three, with eldest Elizabeth and elder brother Charles. Robin is raised in privilege, along with his siblings, by a stern elderly father. Sir Charles is Birmingham's tough Northern Irish Chief Constable, who for over 30 years has been charged with sorting out the Peaky Blinders gangs and has been knighted for his efforts. Sir Charles brooks no mischief, expects results. Robin is provided an education at the exclusive private establishments Shrewsbury School and Cheltenham College, where he enthusiastically excels at boxing, cricket, rugby, and other sporting activities. Sir Charles dies in 1935 when Robin is 14 and still at Shrewsbury. When he later leaves Cheltenham in June 1939, the threat of imminent war inspires Robin to take a short service commission in the RAF and commence his flight training. Robin doesn't exactly impress the RAF. Enthusiasm can take you only so far. To survive as a fighter pilot against Germany's top killers, you must have skill and a lot of luck. Upon passing his final exam with a mediocre 64%, Robin's tutors submit their assessment. Ground subjects are poor average, navigation and airmanship weak. A safe pilot but lacks polish, a keen average officer. At just 18 years of age, Robin is posted to his first operational unit, number 225 Squadron RAF, three days before Hitler launches his Blitzkrieg upon Western Europe. Over the following two months, Robin flies convoy patrols in Lysanders along England's south coast. When the Battle of Britain commences in July's second week, however, Fighter Command's casualties start to mount. By August, pilot losses have become so critical, operational training units nationwide are unable to meet the demands for replacements. Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding puts out a call for volunteers. Like father, like son, Pilot Officer Rafter is not slack in answering the call of his country. Robin puts his name forward for single-engine fighters, and on August the 22nd, in the midst of the Battle of Britain, he commences Spitfire training at Number 7 Operational Training Unit at RAF Harden in North Wales. Most of Robin's fellow trainees are several years older and have far more flying hours logged. 
Spitfires are an entirely new experience to the now 19-year-old Robin. To make matters worse, the operational training units have been pressured to cut their training programs from four weeks to just 14 days. So great is the demand to supply replacement pilots to the frontline squadrons. Robin's logbook does not survive, but he almost certainly only received between 10 to 20 hours on Spitfires before being qualified on type. It's unlikely at this point in the battle, given the shortage of time and ammunition, that Robin would have even received instruction on air-to-air -air firing or any tactical combat training. World War II historian Dilip Sarka highlights a particular flaw in the system. He compares Robin's training schedule to that of flying officer Ian Hallam. Who decided, I wonder, which pilots went to which squadrons? What criterion, if any, was used other than, on paper, all were qualified to fly the Spitfire operationally? On 31st of August, Flying Officer Hallam, who was a pilot of several years' experience, was posted to 610 County of Chester Squadron at Acklington in 13 Group. Based in the north of England, 610 Squadron was absorbing replacement pilots and providing further training, so Hallam was able to record a further 21 Spitfire flying hours before being posted south to 222 Natal Squadron. The inexperienced pilot officer Robin Rafter, however, was posted straight from Harden into the front line, joining a heavily engaged squadron in the thick of battle. But whose pen, I wonder, made that stroke? And would it not have made better sense to send flying officer Hallam south and pilot officer Rafter North. On paper though, both were qualified pilots, and that appears to be the only consideration when postings were chosen. Enthusiastic, but completely starved of experience, Robin is hurled right into the crucible of combat. He is posted to number 603 City of Edinburgh Squadron at RAF Hornchurch, one of 11 Group's frontline sector stations in South Wessex. Six oh three is led from the front by the Canny Scots squadron leader George Lovell Denholm, known to his men as Uncle George on account of his immense age, thirty-one. Denholm at least sees to it that his squadron gains the best advantage of altitude before engaging a vastly numerically superior enemy. Some of the warriors Robin will be up against will be the cream of the Luftwaffe, already well seasoned in battle with fearsome reputations amongst the most accomplished fighter pilots on Earth. Robin's Hornchurch is a fiery, bombed-out canvas of chaos in the first week of September. Reich Marshal Hermann Goering's explicit orders that the RAF must be wiped off the map prior to the invasion being taken seriously by the determined bomber crews of the Third Reich. Pilot Officer Rafter flies his first operational sortie on Thursday, September the 5th. He takes off with 603 Squadron from Hornchurch just after 9.30 a.m. Robin is about to receive some further Spitfire tuition, the hardest kind actual combat. Two huge enemy formations have been plotted coming in over Dungeness, comprising Dornier bombers and an escort of up to 70 Messerschmitt 109 fighters. Other RAF squadrons are closing in with 603 over Kent. They engage the enemy en masse at a great height. One can only imagine Robin's bewilderment at his first experience of the chaos of massed aerial combat.
Godwin later wrote a letter to his mother, Lady Catherine, describing the extraordinary circumstances of his first encounter with the enemy. Well, I was over Kent at a little over 25,000 feet on the lovely morning of September the 5th when I sighted a huge formation of Jerry's. I very nearly shot a Spitfire down by mistake, but then saw on the starboard side, underneath me, an ME-109. I got all fixed and started my dive onto the 109 and was nearing it when I saw in my mirror a couple of 109s on my tail. Well, I took whatever evasive action I could, but found too a bit of a problem. I started to get away from them when my tail must have been damaged, as all movement on the control column was to no avail, thus putting my machine out of control so far as I was concerned. The machine's nose dropped violently, thus having the effect of throwing me forward, the force so great that I went through the canopy, thus unknowingly injuring my head. I can't imagine my surprise. I was then at 15,000 feet and floating about the air rather like a cork. I pulled the cord, the parachute opened up, and I breathed once more. I floated down right through the aerial battle that was taking place. I came through it without a scratch, but then I noticed an ME-109 coming towards me, and you've no idea what a damned fool you feel suspended in mid-air with an enemy fighter buzzing around you. Well, he never fired at me, as a Spitfire came along and drove him off. Whether he would have done so or not cannot be said. Next worry was where I was going to land, as there were a lot of trees near. I avoided them and landed in a nice field. My Spitfire, which was new, crashed in a ploughed field some way away. The local defence volunteers accosted me with a shotgun as I was wearing my RAF battle dress, which must have confused them a bit. I was treated by a local first aid post, then taken to hospital. Robin Spitfire plunges into this field, Jewel House, right where I'm standing, half a mile outside the village of Marden. Very quickly, some villagers gather over there to stare at the blazing fighter. Someone else is very curious. My father, Edward, who is 14 at the time. I was at home for the summer holidays in 1940 with a school friend when the Battle of Britain was in full spate over Mid-Kent. My school friend and I would go up to the flat roof at Spitsbrook with an ordnance survey map and binoculars. Lying on our backs, we would watch the battle overhead, plot the crashes and then go down to our bikes and pedal furiously to get to a wreck before the police and army arrived to keep the crowds at bay. We built up an extensive accumulation of treasures, including parachutes, helmets, belts of ammunition, berry flares, you name it. In one instance, we saw a Spitfire go down just the other side of Marden Village. I could take you to the exact spot, which is only a few hundred yards from where I live now. Although several villagers were there when we arrived, no one was taking any interest in one of the Spitfire's eight machine guns that was lying apart from the wreckage, which was still burning fiercely. The gun weighed a ton, and clearly we couldn't make off with it at the time so we hid it carefully in the hedge. A week or two later, when the wreckage had been removed and the guards withdrawn, we returned, wrapped it in a raincoat and lashed it to the carrier of my bike. The following ride back through the village drew a lot of comments because I was wobbling as though drunk. We finally got it home and I subsequently donated this and all my other spoils after the war to the Battle of Britain Air Warfare Museum at Lashenden. Pilot Officer Robin Rafter isn't the only pilot whose fighter plane crashed in Marden that day. At almost the same instant that Robin's boots hit the dirt and the parachute settles around him, Another cherry. a Messerschmitt 109 crash lands on a farm just over a mile away. The Marden Fire Brigade report reads as follows. September the 5th, 9.45 a.m. Two aircraft seem to fall in Marden Beach area reported HQ and left. Found first plane to be British. Crash in Beach Lane. Pilot landed by parachute. Plane burning in middle of open field. 
second plane was German ME 109, landing intact at Love's Farm. Pilot attempted to fire the ship, but was prevented. At 11.45 a.m., returned to station and reported. Present, Redgrave, Weaver and Johnson. The German pilot who crash lands at Love's Farm is none other than the soon-to-be-famous Oberleutnant Baron Franz von Vera. Records now reveal that von Vera was brought down by South African pilot officer Basil Gerald Stapleton of Robin Rafter's very own 603 Squadron. Part of Stapleton's combat report for that engagement reads as follows. I was diving to attack when I was engaged by two ME-109s. When I fired at the first one, I noticed glycol coming from his radiator. I did a number two attack, and as I fired I was hit by bullets from another ME-109. I broke off downwards and continued my dive. At 6,000 feet I saw a single engine machine diving vertically with no tail unit. I looked up and I saw a parachutist coming down, circled by an ME-109. I attacked the 109 from the low quarter. He dived vertically towards the ground and flattened out at ground level. I then did a series of beam attacks from both sides and the enemy aircraft turned into my attacks. He finally force landed. He tried to set his radio on fire by taking off his jacket, setting fire to it and putting it in the cockpit. He was prevented by the local defence volunteers. Yours? Mine. Years later, Stapleton recalled the incident in a conversation with historian Dilip Sarkar who provided Stapleton with a copy of his original combat report uncovered at the National Archives at Kew. Incredibly, Stapleton had no idea until that moment that he was the pilot who brought down von Vera. The Swiss Baron would later become immortalised in the 1959 film The One That Got Away, starring Hardy Kruger, which describes von Vera's matchless escape attempts to return to Germany and get back into the war. Curiously, Gerald Stapleton had no trouble recalling the treetop chase behind Von Vera. It was right on the deck. I recall having to shoot carefully so as to avoid hitting people working in the fields. The bullet holes from Stapleton's Brownings still pepper the brickwork of Love's farmhouse. What has now emerged is that Oberleutnant Franz von Vera was the 109 pilot circling Robin as he descended on his parachute, and 603 Squadron's pilot officer Gerald Stapleton was the Spitfire pilot who stepped in and drove the Baron off, bringing him down at Love's Farm in the field known as the 30 Acres. Miriam Honus, who lived at Love's Farm at the time, wrote a diary describing all the action she observed during the Battle of Britain. From the vantage point of her farmhouse just outside Marden, Miriam had a ringside seat, not only to watch the final moments of Von Vera's 109, which came down in her father's field, but also of Robin's predicament, descending on his parachute a mile away as his brand new Spitfire plunged into Jewel House Field. Miriam misidentifies Robin's aeroplane as a hurricane, but describes the incident as follows. By September the 5th, we no longer took shelter, but always went to look from the top windows to see as much as we possibly could. That morning, about 12.30, we could hear bursts of machine gun fire, and there were a great many zooms as our fighters dived to attack. I first saw one of our hurricanes with engine roaring crash round the plane about a mile away. Was very relieved some minutes later to see the pilot drifting to the ground in his parachute. Next I heard the stupendous roar of a very close aeroplane and to my horror the black crosses and swastika of a mesh spit flashed very low by the top west window. 
The measurement was so low that the Lewis gun and the searchlight 250 yards along the road shot at it. Round and round the house flew the German with the Spitfire firing volleys of bullets and determined not to lose his quarry. Just by our own gate, the soldiers just setting out for the crashed hurricane all fired their rifles. And then I heard Mother call, he's down. And I dashed into my room to behold the Messerschmitt just settled in the middle of the 30 acres. It was most exciting watching the soldiers run across the fields carrying their rifles. Meanwhile, the Spitfire and one other circled the spot. In less time than it takes to write, army vans, police and ambulance and a crowd of people converged on the scene from all directions. We had a perfect view of it from my top window. Over 30 years later in the 1970s, Trevor Simmons of Marden, with the help of Trevor Matthews, decide to excavate the crash site of Robin's Spitfire at Jewel House. I just knew it was going to be one of them days. It was a Sunday in the mid-1970s, and it couldn't make up its mind whether to rain or not. The seaweed says yes, and as sure as little apples turn into big apples, it obliged, but not in torrents. Over the next few hours, the two Trevors succeed in raising Robin's Spitfire engine and other debris to the surface. A strong smell of petrol is reported. Today, the recovered engine of Pilot Officer Rafter's brand new Spitfire can be viewed at Lashenden Air Warfare Museum at Headcorn Aerodrome. Fifty years later, with the permission of farmer Peter Hall, Spitfire restorer and Battle of Britain historian Stephen Vizard carries out a further survey of the Jewel House site. <laughs> Have we got anything? There's very little there, I don't think, is there? Can you smell it? but the smell of petrol can still be detected 83 years after Spitfire X4264 plunged into the Marden countryside. The doctors at Maidstone's West Kent Hospital perform an operation to stitch up the back of Robin's head. They tend to the cut in his cheek and remove some shrapnel from his right leg. The enthusiastic young pilot is keen to get back into the fray. In a letter to his mother, Lady Catherine, Robin writes, I have been up and about for the last three days. I am coming out by the end of this week and will soon return to get my own back on the jerrys. There is a saying that you are not a fighter pilot until you have been shot down once. Well, you've nothing more to fret about, and you've heard everything there was, and see how simple it all was, and how well I was cared for. I'm still as good as new, with no facial disfigurement. Might even get a few days leave to see you. You must remember that I got off lightly, and many more have received worse than me. Robin spends a few weeks convalescing at Maidstone before being transferred to the officer's hospital down at Torquay in the West Country. And it is here, on October the 11th, that Robin receives the shocking news of the death of his elder brother, Charles. Serving as a pilot with number 214 Squadron, Pilot Officer Charles Rafter has been undergoing training on Wellington bombers. Earlier that day, Wellington L7840 was taking off when it swerved to starboard, crashed out of control into the corner of number one hangar and burst into flames. Charles 
and the three other crew members were killed, and two others on the ground seriously injured. Robin returns home for his brother's funeral. Charles is laid to rest next to his father at St. Peter's Church, just a few yards from the family home in Harborne, Birmingham. Charles is just 22. By the time Robin rejoins 603 at Hornchurch on November the 7th, the Battle of Britain is over, but the fighting is not. Goering is no longer willing to tolerate daytime bomber losses at the hands of RAF pilots who mysteriously keep multiplying, so the Luftwaffe still flies fighter incursions by day over England's southeast. At night, however, the bombers can raid with impunity. And by the time Robin rejoins 603 as a recovering non-combatant, London has been systematically bombed for 56 out of 57 consecutive nights. Tens of thousands of civilians are killed and injured by the time the Blitz raids cease in May 1941. Pilot officer Robin Rafter is finally pronounced fit and cleared for flight operations at Hornchurch. On Friday, November the 29th, Robin takes off with 603 in what is his second ever operational Spitfire sortie, led from the front, as usual, by squadron leader Denholm. A lone Messerschmitt 110 is intercepted off the coast of Ramsgate and used as target practice by all nine Spitfires before disappearing into the channel. Upon the return flight to Hornchurch, however, the pilots of 603 watch, horrified, as Robin Spitfire drops out of formation, peels away downward, and destroys itself in a meadow just outside the county town of Maidstone. Robin's life ends here in this beautiful meadow on the outskirts of Kingswood Village. His plane had not been damaged in combat, and oxygen supply failure, the curse of a number of pilot casualties, was ruled out since the squadron was returning to Hornchurch at 2,500 feet. Robin's sister Elizabeth believes her 19-year-old brother blacked out as a result of the head injury he had sustained bailing out of that first Spitfire on September the 5th over Marden Village. He was still not 100% in my opinion, but was so keen to get back to his squadron and into the air again. I will always be absolutely convinced that this was the case. Maggie Woods' family has owned this field for generations. Her aunt was in the woods nearby when Robin came down. But obviously it came from that direction and she was there and she heard it and she ran through the woods barefoot because she thought something was going to happen. But the time it crashed, it was an almighty crash and it had crashed before she got to it. Obviously it was smoke and debris and there was a lot of ammunition on it and she said the bullets were just exploding and then they came and I think the men who came, well it must have been from the air ministry, and they came and she said they brought black boxes and she remembers the black boxes and she said it took three days to get him out, all of him out.
Robin knew he wasn't the RAF's best fighter pilot yet, but he was willing to learn. He knew he would be up against the legends of the Luftwaffe, outnumbered, with a life expectancy of maybe just a few weeks. To me, the testament of Robin's valour is that knowing these things, he went out and faced the enemy anyway. Robin lived long enough to learn about Hitler's cancellation of Sea Lion, the planned invasion of Great Britain. Robin duly appears here on the Battle of Britain Memorial just outside Folkestone and the Battle of Britain Monument on London's embankment by the Houses of Parliament. There are 2,938 British and Allied aircrew names on these walls. Average age, perhaps 20, 22. Each has a story and a past, and all have a future too as heroes until the end of time.